a very good evening to all of you uh, i welcome you back on behalf of the organizing team that is dinanath mangeshkar hospital in association with lva and apla so the laryngology webinar series this is the second module so we'll be beginning the speech our first speaker is dr marina matbaki she is a renowned laryngologist practicing in malaysia so ma'am will be delivering her first speech on the topic of microlaryngoscopy with cold instruments microflap technique ma'am without uh, taking further time you can start hello hi good day everyone um my topic today is on microlaryngoscopy with cold instruments microflap technique um all is gold First of all, I would like to thank um, Dr. Sachin Gandhi and team for inviting me to deliver this talk. This is um, a great effort by the um, Voice Clinic Dinath Mageshkar Hospital and Research Center Pune, India. Um, and I would like to um, greet everyone. Happy World Voice Day. Today is 16 April um, 2022. And uh, Malaysia, we have um, done a few activities to enhance the awareness of people on the importance of taking care of boys. And here we have um, featured in the um, news and in the um, slot in the TV, and we have done webinar also on newspaper. So um, suara is a Malay word, which means voice. So for this topic today, uh, I will start with some introduction on benign vocal foliation, whether we need to do surgery or non-surgery, and um, followed by surgical technique, vocal foliation and vocal fold polyp, followed by conclusion. The treatment of benign vocal foliations, right? So whenever we come to a diagnosis, a cyst nodule of polyp, by that time, we would have done history taking and we would have identified what are the predisposing factors like if the patient is smoking or have been taking alcohol does the patient have any symptoms of allergic rhinitis or laryngopharyngeal reflux and um, by putting endoscopy if we are doing um, flexible nasopharyngeal laryngoscopy we would see identify whether there are any signs in the nose and in the nasopharynx um, of um, allergic rhinitis and the question is, if someone have post-acid drip, would you treat um, the patient um, with medications for allergic rhinitis, or would you treat the patient with um, laryngopharyngeal reflux medications, or both? So the algorithm of treatment is, if the patient have marked symptoms, marked nasal symptoms, we would treat the nose first. If the patient have a marked post-acid drip, and um, with very on there is no um, necessary symptoms at all or very minimal and there are there is marked um, laryngopharyngeal reflux findings and you may want to treat the laryngopharyngeal reflux first and what about surgery surgery is the definitive treatment for most of cases of benign vocal foliations but not every cases we're going to discuss of this and what is the the, the role of voice therapy and what about um, education on vocal hygiene? We're going to talk a little bit after this. So I would um, recommend everyone to have um, a small leaflet or pamphlet in your clinic um, to give to the patient by the time they um, finish the session with you so that they can go back and read about what is, what is the important points and tips in taking care of the voice and for them to adhere to vocal hygiene. And someone who have big lesions, voice therapy alone wouldn't be effective. However, we still it is still necessary for us to refer, refer those patients to the SLP because um, the session with SLP will help them to adhere to voice rest of the surgery and for them to adhere to vocal hygiene of the surgery and to help them to resume vocalization after certain time of voice rest of the surgery 
And by doing this, it would help to optimize healing process, um, epithelization and minimize scarring of the microsurgery. And this also would prevent recurrence of lesions on the vocal fold. So benign vocal fold lesions, the management is quite straightforward. If nodules, we wouldn't um, do surgery first. The primary treatment is non-surgical, but for polyp and cyst, in most cases would need surgery. However, there is role of non-surgical treatment in tiny polyp. So I give an example of this patient who is a singer. She can't reach high note and her voice breaks during singing. She gives a um, sim sim history of symptoms of allergic rhinitis. And you can see she has nodules on both sides of the vocal fold. And on phonation, we can see that she has hourglass type of closure. Although the wave, the mucosal wave, uh, look just mildly asymmetrical. And on high pitch, the hourglass closure is marked. And with these findings and symptoms, um, the patient is treated with um, allergic rhinitis medication and referred to SLP for voice therapy and also educate the patient on vocal hygiene. And this is a month of the treatment. We can see that the nodule almost disappear. We can um, see it here. And on stroboscopy examination, this is on um, low note. Um, we can see that there is complete closure, unlike one month ago. However, on high notes, there is still slight nodule can be seen, it's like edema. Thus, there is still um, our glass closure. So we have to advise this patient to continue voice rest and continue with the treatment. Right, and um, so now I'm going to talk on surgical technique, uh, microflat. Before that, what is phonomicrosurgery? We, are, we have been doing phonomicrosurgery. The surgery is to achieve a flexible oscillation of musculomembranous growth of mucosa by preserving the 3D microstructure of the vocal fold, um, namely the epithelium and lamina propria. I got this picture from Steven Zaitel's paper. Um, microflap technique um, is recommended to um, enable maximal preservation of epithelium by precise excision. And um, in this microflap technique, we need to do a delicate tangential cutting on the superficial lamina propria along the curving vocal fold. As you can see here, the vocal fold is a three-dimensional and by using this micro instrument and this um, curved elevator, um, we would be able to do surgery and um, respect the 3D structure of the vocal fold. So this is the micro flap technique in micro, phonomicrosurgery. Um, this uh, phonomicrosurgery with micro flap technique is very useful in vocal fold cyst because of all the lesions, when you compare nodule, polyp, and cyst, cyst carries the highest risk of vocal fold scar um, because um, there is tendency, higher tendency of rupture um, during the section. When um, the cyst rupture, um, there's normally um, loss of dissection plane, and this would lead to vocal fold scarring if you are not careful. And the loss of the rupture also may cause incomplete removal of the cyst, and hence there is risk of recurrence. Right, when we are performing phonomicrosurgery, the microlaryngeal instruments are important. So I show these pictures um, comparing um, micro two sizes of microlaryngeal instrument. The one that the tip size about two millimeter is recommended. For example, this is Buchaya forcep. We have this Buchaya forcep that size about four millimeter, and the other one is about one point five or two millimeter. So the one that smaller um, size is recommended for phonomicrosurgery to optimize the outcome. 
and having different types of laryngoscopes are also important because um, some patients have issues of difficult laryngeal exposure. So when we talk about um, microflap technique, there are two um, techniques that have been described, lateral microflap and medial um, microflap. In lateral microflap, the incision is made way lateral um, from the lesion. Hence, when the incision is made, the vocal, the vocal ligament will be visualized and the dissection is made along the plane of the vocal ligament to preserve it and until you can see the lesion. And um, this flap that have, create, that have been created um, is preserved to put it to put back on, on the vocal fold after the lesion is removed, after the cyst is removed. However, uh, this technique is not really recommended because by doing this, um, when we are doing the section on the vocal li ligament, we can stimulate this maneuver, this manipulation would stimulate the fibroblast in the um, intermediate and deep lamina propria. Hence, there would be formation of collagen and lead to formation of scar. The other technique, which is medial microflap, instead of making the incision way lateral from the lesion, the incision is made on the lesion itself. And whenever um, the incision is open and flap is raised, um, the lesion and the cyst is seen in the superficial lamina propria and followed by the section of using the microinstrument laryngeal elevator. Um, the cyst is dissected from the vocal ligament. And after that, cyst together with a small um, size of the overlying epithelium is removed. So this is medial microflap technique. All right, I'm going to show you the technique um, on this patient that I have performed who has um, vocal fold cyst. It looks like an epidermoid cyst. The patient has a cyst in the mid-membranous part of the vocal fold. And um, we can see on the opposite side, the patient also has sulcus. And on phonation, we can see that it's reduced vibration or reduced amplitude. On high pitch, there is severe asymmetry of mucosal wave. And the patient has um, duration, the duration of closure is predominantly open, hence the patient's voice is a little breathy and she has reduced maximum phonation time. So um, in doing this surgery, hydrodissection is recommended so that this diffusion of either you use saline or you can use one in 10,000 adrenaline will be diffused along the space in the superficial lamina propria and this um, step would minimize uh, the injury to the superficial, superficial lamina propria during the section. So I normally use a butterfly needle and whenever the needle, the bevel of the needle disappear from the mucosa, the saline or one in 10,000 adrenaline is injected to elevate um, the epithelium uh, from the superficial lamina propria or from the vocal ligament. And the incision had then made on the cyst itself. Um, the sickle knife is used a curved uh, sickle knife. And note that the direction of the sickle knife so that it is facing superior, so that when you make the incision, it will tend the mucosa superiorly and prevent injury to the vocal ligament. Then the um, laryngeal elevator is used to elevate the microflap, the epithelium. And after that, um, a Boucheia forcep is used, the micro forcep is used to um, grasp the epithelium that had been elevated. And um, this laryngeal elevator is used to dissect this um, cyst from the vocal ligament. And this elevator is also used to dissect the attachment, the fibrous attachment of the vocal fold cyst. Then after that, when the cyst is loosened, dissected from the vocal ligament, if the cyst is not ruptured, 
which is um, you're very lucky in this um, instance, the patient has epidermoxis, so it is not as fragile as um, retention cysts. And the cyst is grasped using uh, Buchaya forcep and um, micro -cyst, curved micro is, is used to cut the rest of the attachment. And, and this is the end of surgery that we want. This is what we want. The flap is put back. It's unlike uh, the one that I have um, shown before, the epithelium is removed together with the cyst. I'm going to show afterwards when uh, the, the, the instance where you need to remove the epithelium together with the cyst. In this case, we don't have to, and the recovery will be faster. And you can see that the epithelium covered um, the vocal fold uh, fully. And this is three months after surgery. The patient has nice mucosal wave, which will be shown shortly after this. This is on eye scan. And you can see that symmetrical mucosal wave, there is no vocal fold scarring. And on high pitch, the patient also have good uh, mucosal wave and good glottal closure. Right, so we move to the next slide. So you can view this video on the YouTube channel, uh, my YouTube channel on the, I have uploaded it. So um, in cases where the cyst rupture um, during the section, like in this case, um, this mucus retention cyst is more fragile than epidermoid cyst. So whenever it rupture, what should we do? So I'm going to demonstrate here. So see when the, the cyst is ruptured, all right? Um, cotton ball can be used to dissect. I want you to appreciate that when we dissect with a cotton ball, we can see where the sac of the epithelium of the cyst is, which is over there on the mucosa, which has been dissected from the vocal ligament. So here, rather than a leaving cyst behind, we need to remove the, the epithelium together with the remnant, the cyst wall, like we are doing type one chordectomy. And um, at the end of it, we would put whatever um, left mucosa and um, cover uh, the raw area and you would still have a good voice outcome. I give an example of this patient, which um, this which have a huge cyst which he kept he kept ten years, and you can see that the cyst is kind of wrapped the superficial, uh, superior part of the vocal fold, the free edge as well as the inferior edge of the vocal fold, and this is his voice. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, semasa saya masih kecil, saya tinggal di kampung bersama nenek. Ayah dan mak tinggal. His voice is rough and there's some readiness component. And I want to show you on a video stroboscopy. The mucosal wave are severely asymmetrical. There is no complete closure and it is aperiodic as well. And of course, I had issues, problem uh, during the section. Uh, the cyst ruptured and I had to do like, you know, what I have demonstrated before, that one conductomy. And this is his voice of the surgery. Uh, before that, I want to show the stroboscopy, the findings. You can see that this is in slow motion. There is some evidence of scar at the side, but you still can see mucosal wave. There's some reduced amplitude and there's some small scar over there. However, the patient can get a good glottal closure and it is not, um, it is still vibrating. And his voice is good and he's quite happy with it. Semasa saya masih kecil, saya tinggal di kampung bersama nenek. Ayah dan mak tinggal di bandar. Abang so, this is when we need to do, uh, we remove the epithelium together with the sac 
of the cyst. Right, postoperatively, this is very important. Breast avoids two to seven days. Too long may cause vocal um, muscle atrophy, so it is not recommended. In patients who have high voice demand, give a longer medical certificate leave so that uh, they wouldn't um, fully use the voice uh, too soon. And it is important to give prophylaxis um, proton pump inhibitor, 40 milligram BD, and advise the patient re again and again emphasize on vocal hygiene. Now, what about vocal full polyps? Do we need to do microflap? So in vocal fold polyps, in tiny polyp, there is role of non-surgical treatment. I give an example of this patient who has severe allergic rhinitis, who is a chronic smoker, and he's abused his voice a lot at work, coffee lover, and practice on healthy diet. And when he presented, he has a lot of mucus, uh, endolaryngeal mucus. He has polyp at the membranous part of the vocal fold on the left side, and there is also a reactive lesion on the opposite side. And when uh, three weeks after commencing um, medical treatment, um, allergic rhinitis treatment, educate patient on vocal hygiene, tell him to stop coffee, rest his voice, and we can see that the polyp has reduced in size as well as the opposite side, the reactive lesion, and there is no more a thick endolaryngeal mucus. And this is the vocal flow of the patients months after the treatment. There is no more polyp. And on stroboscopy, there is symmetrical mucosal wave. Um, there is no non vibrative segment. So um, there is still role of non-surgical treatment in a tiny polyp. However, in big polyps, um, in big polyps, it is quite impossible uh, to treat with non-surgical treatment. Um, but then the question is whether you need to do microflap or without microflap in endovalaryngeal microsurgery. I give example of this polyp, which is pedunculated and with a thin neck, as you can see. It's flopping and you can see the difference between the abnormal mucosa and normal mucosa. In this case, hydrodissection may not be necessary and uh, probably not recommended because you want to see the difference between the two. And when you can use the micro scissors, the curved micro scissors, to cut at the border between the um, abnormal mucosa and normal, normal mucosa, like, like, like so. And you can accurately um, cut the vocal polyp, polyp without injuring the vocal li ligament and preserve the superficial lamina propria. However, in um, other types of polyp, which is pedunculated, um, but firm in consistent and big, it is quite difficult to hold it with um, a buchaya faucet to cut at the neck of the polyp. Hence, hydrodissection is um, useful to elevate this, um, the epithelium from the vocal ligament. And we can use a sickle knife um, to make an incision at the neck between the polyp, the abnormal, abnormal mucosa, and the um, normal mucosa. And after that, we can use buchaya forcep to grasp the epithelium that we have incised and remove the polyp. And by doing this, we would be able um, to get a nice outcome like this with um, symmetrical mucosal wave, without muscle tension dysphonia, and without any non vibrating segment. Right. So um, here I want to show a small polyp, but it is broad based. So hydrodissection is still very useful, although the polyp is small. Um, and very useful also because the polyp, the hemorrhagic polyp is on the superior surface of the vocal fold. Um, hence, if you're not careful, you may injure the vocal ligament. And use sickle knife and again, um, grasp the epithelium with the polyp 
use a curved micro scissors and then you can see the vocal ligament underneath the superficial lamina propria and you can cut the polyp off. Broad based polyp, um, hydrodite section is very important and you have to do medium microflat. However, um, unlike a vocal force cyst, there's no way you can preserve uh, the microflat that you base because um, the pathogenesis of, um, of the vocal for polyp is extrusion or protrusion of abnormal or edematous epithelium. So all the edematous epithelium has to be removed because it, that is the, the pathological site. However, you can preserve as much as normal mucosa for you to put back on the vocal fold to cover um, the raw area. So I give an example of this patient who is a chronic smoker and uses his voice a lot, a middle um, aged man. You can see a big um, polyp, hemorrhagic polyp with some hyperkeratosis and there is um, reactive lesion on the opposite side. So in this type of polyp, we need to do, this is um, endoscopic view, direct laryngoscopy. Um, we need to do microplat, like, you know, shown here, hydrodissection first, make incision, like, you know, the surgical technique that I've shown before. And then we expose the, the gelatinous material, which is underneath the mucosa. And subsequently, um, the flap together with gelatinous, gelatinous um, um, what do you call that material is, um, is together, is elevated yeah, together and removed. And normal mucosa is put back to cover raw area as much as possible. And this is the same patients, five months after um, endolaryngeal microsurgery, there's some, probably some abnormal mucosa over there, probably some small scarring. And uh, on video stroboscopy, however, you can see a nice mucosa wave, although probably there's some small scarring over there, but it is, there is no non-vibrating segment. The mucosal wave is quite symmetrical or probably mildly asymmetrical because there's some reduced um, amplitude and the patient happy with the voice. So in conclusion, um, phonomicrosurgery using cold instruments are recommended when performing uh, surgery in benign lesions. Hydrodissection uh, minimize injury to the vocal ligament with preservation of superficial lamina propria, uh, middle microflap using um, uh, microlaryngeal instruments is preferred um, compared to lateral microflap, and this technique would um, respect um, the three D structure or the vocal fold. And uh, microflap is normally proposed for vocal fold cyst and broad based um, polyp. For vocal fold polyp, the mucosa is abnormal, so it needs to be excised um, together. Unlike uh, the vocal fold says, there is chance for you to preserve um, the epithelium um, using the microflap technique. That ends my lecture. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Marina. That was a very good lecture. So now, moving on to the second topic of the day, the second lecture would be given by Dr. Sachin Gandhi on the topic that is benign lesions of vocal fold, transoral laser microscopic surgery of laryngeal papilloma and sulcus vocalis. Good afternoon, everybody. Just uh, share my screen. Uh, Thank you, Marina, for a wonderful talk. And we'll move on to using lasers for benign lesions of the vocal cord or of the larynx. Today, we are going to concentrate mainly on laryngeal papilloma, sulcus vocalis, and laryngoceles or secular cysts. 
maybe in detail we'll discuss the papilloma and sulcus vocalis and get introduction to the laryngocele and cycloid cysts and discuss it further in our next briefings laser is an acronym for light amplification by a stimulated emission of radiation so basically it's a radiation which has been aligned collimated and then targeted on the tissue with great energy what are the advantages of using laser in the larynx or laryngeal surgery number one of course is hemostasis we are we, we are doing endoscopic surgeries hemostasis is very important there is minimum surrounding tissue trauma when we use lasers because of minimum trauma there is a better healing better access to the target tissue we are dealing with vocal cords and patients have come not for a polyp or a cyst or for early or glottic carcinoma they have come for their dysphonia their change in voice and they want their voice back so we have to remove whatever is there on the vocal cords with micro precision so of course the role of laser comes there which has got a surgical accuracy of less than 100 microns there is minimum instrument involvement that's why no mechanical movement of the instruments this also results in less inflammation and better healing and of course less post operative pain the surgical time is less which results in less hospitalization and most of the surgeries mainly for benign lesions are day care surgeries only part is of thermal damage because of the laser which may lead to scarring of the vocal fold so we have to use different tricks to reduce the thermal damage we have seen these uh, i mean uh, tricks and skills in the last lecture but they would come over in uh, the coming slides which we are going to see which are the lasers we use in larynx two types a free beam laser which is a co2 laser when it is a free beam then there is a less instrumentation and good exposure when we compare it with fiber transmissible laser then it always one hand which holds the fiber in our hands and it may reduce the exposure but what's the advantage of fiber transmissible laser we will always have a tactile feedback because we are touching the tissues with whatever laser we have with the laser fiber it can be used in contact or non contact mode and it gives better hemostasis because of its physical properties which are the fiber transmissible lasers a diode laser and a ktm ktp laser which are the angiolytic lasers which block the blood vessels pulse ktp and pulse dye laser and when we use a co2 laser uh, there is always thinking that the thermal damage would cause scarring of the vocal fold but i mean uh, they always say when you cut with the recent co2 lasers in the market then what you see during the surgery is what you get post operatively so there is a minimum tissue damage with the latest lasers which are available in the um, industry with different accessories like acu blade and scanner mode and uh, different ultra pulse and super pulse and different modes so these are the histopathological sites which show minimum damage to the lamina propria which would reduce the mucosal wave what are the principles in phono surgery or you have to adhere to number 1 again a good exposure so we have to use good micro uh, laryngoscope expanding laryngoscope a good suspension system 
next strapping or third hand technique to give exposure to the desired area you have to observe with the microscope with the endoscope and palpate the tissue before you really indulge in any surgical excision have a good hemostasis cause minimum trauma to the surrounding tissue with different instrumentation you already seen the microsurgical instruments uh, marina was showing in the surgical clips you can use laser minimum inflammation we already learned the edge of the vocal cord or vocal cord itself is a three dimensional structure it's not like a paper it's a three dimensional structure so the edge of the vocal cord or the free edge of the vocal cord has got three surfaces the superior the middle and the inferior and you have to restrict your surgery to the desired surface so you have to identify from which surface the lesion is coming in from and limit your surgery for that surface because lesion on the free vocal cord you use laser uh i mean i'm i'm going to see about uh, a tell about the healing uh, after the surgery uh, in the next few slides different modes of the laser when we use for the vocal cord lesions when it is from the free edge of the vocal fold you use a single or a repeat mode when the lesion is on the superior surface of the vocal cord like a ringcase edema or we are going to see papillomas in on the superior surface you can again go in for a repeat mode the lesions malignant lesions of the vocal cord or when you are doing partial arachnoid tummy then you can use continuous mode because in that case you are interested in rad radical excision rather than the functional outcome what are the different indications for cono surgical uh, application you can use lasers for benign vocal cord pathology benign lesions could be protruding lesions from the edge of the vocal cord like nodules papilloma polyps cysts they could be recessed lesions like sulcus vocalis or flat lesion on the surface of the vocal cord like leukoplakia or intramucosal cysts you can use laser surgery or laser for alteration of pitch you can use lasers for laryngeal malignancy and of course lasers for compromised airway is three topics we are going to discuss in our forthcoming sessions in surgical setup there should be good alignment of the instruments good alignment of the microscope focusing should be Uh, perfect you should align the beam to the micro optics of the microscopes you should protect the surrounding areas from non target strikes that is lip teeth or subglottis uh, we are going to see this in the clips which we are going to see but always see to it you wherever you are firing you should you are firing on the desired location and not to the surrounding areas because we are doing endoscopic surgery you should be careful especially when you are operating in children in the anterior and posterior commissure which because this can result in scarring in these commissures and uh, further anterior web posterior web and uh, stenotic lesions the beam should not get reflected from your instru instruments or the surface of the endoscope this is because this reflected beam can cause ghost burns that is trauma thermal trauma to the surrounding tissue or eustachian tube cuff uh endotracheal tube cuff you can use laryngeal halogen spray to reduce the spasm after finishing the surgery with the lasers as we have seen uh the three surfaces of the edge of the vocal fold you have to limit your surgery to the particular surface 
so when you are limited to the excision only on the superior border then the voice recovery or the healing is fast within 2 to 6 weeks if you excise the superior and the middle border or two borders then it may be delayed further and if you include all the three borders together then voice recovery may take 8 weeks or long and there are chances of scar formation laryngeal papillomas we are just going to see the main principles the surgical principles and how to deal with different situations the most common benign neoplasm of the larynx infection of the or maybe viral infection of the upper parietal cell tract by hpv human papilloma virus clusters of grape like friable masses in the larynx in the trachea sometimes even lungs there were high tendency for recurrences that we have already seen and may cause airway obstruction down into the trachea or bronchi also the malignant transformation is less than 1% of all adult laryngeal papillomas in my series i have six seen six patients of adult laryngeal papilloma but they have not transformed into malignancy after benign presentation but with the presented they presented like uh, laryngeal papillomas and on biopsy they were diagnosed to have squamous cell carcinoma of the larynx so the presentation itself was squamous cell carcinoma rather than transformation into mal malignancy uh we have seen the human papilloma virus has two types uh type 6 is very low risk type 11 is more aggressive and type 16 and 18 are having high risk for transformation into malignancy this you can get with zero typing uh we have done study over 3 years time and checked the zero typing or the types of papilloma in uh, 60 patients in dinar mangesh hospital and we have seen most of them were six we found six patients having uh, type 16 and 18 so we give gave them preventive coverage of vaccines which we are going to see in the next few slides uh, hpv vaccines but nobody has transformed into malignancy as yet the symptoms are again hoarseness dyspnea chronic cough of course recurrent respiratory infections there are grading system to note when the patients because these patients come again and repeatedly so there can severity score as per the clinical presentation or anatomically examination examining these patients clinical like voice spider airway obstruction uh, urgency of emergency intervention and if it is on surface raised bulky lesions so both together we can prepare a score there is another dicker's grading system whether it is sessile exophytic unifocal or multifocal papillomas surgical treatment remains the mainstay of uh, managing these patients there is no single modality of treatment available if it repeats more than four times a year then maybe you would have to go for some adjuvant therapy which we are going to discuss it again there is no permanent cure for laryngeal papilloma as yet for transoral surgery what are the different modalities available micro instruments like if the polyps are uh, papillomas are localized small then of course you can use hydrodissection with micro microclep technique there are different lasers co2 laser ktp and pulse diode laser PDL. We have seen the risk factors of using CO2 laser is anterior web or complete glottic stenosis. For more aggressive lesion, more recurrent lesions, photodynamic therapy has also been already been tried, and we all know what is photodynamic therapy is excitation of injected photosensitizer and. Uh, 
usually these have side effects like dermatitis and skin infections. Uh, so this is maybe a trial in very few of the centers. Recently, compilation and microdebrider has been tried for the papillomas, but they are mainly for debulking of the airway. And as far as you go near the vocal cord, it's better not to use coblator or micro debrider and switch on to either micro scissors or lasers. What's the role of KTP in papillomatosis or phono surgery uh, as such? KTP laser, selective heating of blood in microcirculation. And this is very important without rupturing the vessel or causing the collateral damage. So there is minimum surrounding tissue damage plus angiolysis, that is plus blockage of the blood vessel. There is minimum heating and scarring of the superficial lamina propria, which are going to give good phonophysical results with uh, intact mucosal wave. And this is very important. It protects basement membrane zone linking proteins. These are actually denatured. See, there are layers of vocal cord on the edge of the vocal cord, the superficial epithelium and then superficial layer of lamina propria. So basically, this basement membrane is denatured. You separate the epithelium you separate the epithelium from the superficial lamina propria. So the heat would not go beyond the superficial epithelium and cause damage to the underlying superficial lamina propria. This is the papillomas in the anterior commissure. And we are going to see how we use. So this is a scanner mode of CO2 laser. I'm vaporizing papillomas in the anterior commissure. Again, the principle remain limited to the age of the vocal cord and don't go right into anterior commissure. In the anterior commissure, not to use laser, but remove them with the upturned forceps to prevent web formation in the anterior glottis. A KTP laser Again, in the anterior commissure, in a non-contact mode, we have seen the principle and we are actually uh, visualizing this in the follow-up of this patient. Two images we have seen in our practice, uh, anterior web following removal of papillomas multiple times in the anterior commissure, and this is a case of uh, complete glottic stenosis because of maybe inadvertent use of laser uh, in a child with respiratory papillomatosis. Surgery patients can present with airway obstruction. Try to avoid tracheostomy because seedling of papilloma over the tracheal stoma and down into the trachea and bronchi. You can incubate these children with uncuffed metal tube. I'm going to show you the image in the next slide. You can debulk these lesions with a coblator or micro debrider, and then on the remaining papillomas over the vocal cord, you can use uh, uh, CMA micro instruments or uh, CO2 laser. For a dysphonia, check what is the location of the tumor. If they are on the superior surface of the vocal fold, vaporize with CO2 laser. Age of the vocal fold, excision, you can always use, pop, I mean, you can all use coplator or debrider if they're on the age of the vocal cord. In anterior and posterior commissure, don't apply laser energy. You can remove them with uh, upturned forceps. In patients who are having comorbidities, you can go in for uh, OPD procedures. This is uh, Oswal Hunton tube, uncuffed metal endotracheal tube in cases, pediatric cases, 
who come with airway obstruction and you are not able to really take care of their uh, airway so you can use this tube and actually named after uh, my teacher our teacher and maybe uh, the one who has established this wonderful clinic in our hospital uh, mr vasant oswal from uk he has devised this tube and we are using it in pediatric airway obstruction so this is a tube this is one uh, image or case in which a computer is being used or a, uh, a debrider which has been used again patient with comorbidities and localized papilloma then you can go in for opd procedure with a ktp laser which has been introduced Through a flexible laryngoscope, when you are looking into the papillomas, they could be either solitary or multi-centering over the vocal folds. They could be distal or multi-site. it's very important to have intra operative examination of the entire airway i am going to show you some images we are operating a patient with papillomas over the anterior commissure but we just passed in as a principle we passed in as a practice the endoscope down and we i am show you going to show you in the subglottis and down into the bronchi also so every each and every case examine the entire respiratory tract with a flexible line uh, laryngoscope or uh, endoscope rigid endoscope zero tapping uh, it's available you can get it done uh, not really for the patient's benefit but you can counsel the patient if they turn out to be type 11 by telling them it could be aggressive if they are type 16 or 18 you can give preventive vaccination which is available in the market and you can keep them under observation and counsel the patient regarding probable transformation into malignancy it's available you can get it done for your patients uh, with pathology labs available uh, in india and in uh, many metro cities which are the papilloma which show maximum rate of recurrence there are actually three sites laryngeal surface of the epiglottis the anterior commissure and the subglottis maybe because these are areas in which uh, we can operate easily is very difficult so removal is difficult and that may be one of the reason for recurrence uh, what's important is pre operative video laryngoscopy for each and every patient is necessary to check if the papillomas are there or the laryngeal surface of the epiglottis otherwise you can just straight away pass the scope and you can miss uh, these papillomas plus you should tell the anesthetist how the ventilation you can achieve and which type of tube uh, you can use for uh, securing the airway this is a Maybe focal disease, or maybe a localized disease, multifocal disease on the vocal fold. Multifocal. I mean, uh, we all know these are high chances of uh, having uh, carcinoma in situ. If they are multicentric, maybe you can go in for radiation. And this is a patient actually which I told about. He presented with change in voice and papillomas on the anterior commissure. We just passed in our endoscope down, papilloma in the subglottis and down into the bronchi. We have to deal with these patients accordingly and counsel the patients and manage uh, with necessary measures. This is on the laryngeal surface of the epiglottis. Here you can see clearly. If you note them pre-operatively, 
then you can target these areas with necessary instruments and get them cleared with your surgery. You can enter commissure, posterior commissure. This is again very important area in which you have to take precautions when you are doing surgery because if you damage the posterior interarytenoid area, patient can have post-operative web formation in the posterior glottis and airway obstruction. So better to avoid some papillomas here and use cold instruments to remove these papillomas rather than giving thermal heat or thermal damage with the help of lasers. Uh, Subglottic papillomas, again, very important to check the subglottis with the angled endoscopes after taking the patient under anesthesia, passing in the laryngoscope and with uh, either uh, fiber transmissible laser with probes, you can uh, remove those papillomas or with the angled instruments. On the surface of the vocal fold, you can use a scanner mode of CO2 laser. So with the scanner mode, we vaporize these papillomas and this is how we got preserved mucosal wave and good phonosurgical result after the surgery. So you have to check where the papillomas are coming from and then use a specialized or maybe a necessary instrument. Adjuvant treatment for more than uh, uh, four times or multiple recurrences. Immunomodulation you can do with interferon. Mm, maybe not uh, that popular or having definitive results, but intralesional interferon has now started been using with some uh, results. Anti-proliferative effects. There are anti-inflammatory drugs which have been used, uh, mainly the anti-reflux medicines, uh, which can prevent recurrent epithelial damage, along with some other medicines uh, which have been used. But yes, anti-reflux you can use in many of the patients. Vaccines, we are going to look into it, but there are HPV vaccines available. Uh, mumps vaccine and BCG vaccine has got some load. This is some anti-inflammatory uh, lesion. And these viruses are also uh, seen in serotyping in cases of having laryngeal papillomas. So it has also got has some role. But yes, if the vaccine is the main and we are going to see further. This is a, a promising a new agent which has come over. Uh, it, is, uh, it blocks actually your uh, endothelial growth factor. Uh, we are going to see. But this is local application of Bicad Sizumab which delays the recurrence of laryngeal papilloma and uh, has complementary role because it protects the spread or blocks the blood vessels. Uh, so along with KTP, it can have a complementary effect. We are going to see further. Silofovir again has an antiviral action and has gone, uh, shown promising results in few of the cases we are going to see further. Uh, dietary, you can advise the patient to use uh, or to have in diet uh, some cruciferous uh, vegetables uh, in the diet, which has high concentration of indol 3 carbinol. Silofovir, what's the mechanism of action? It acts against viral DNA polymerase. It is given intralesional in laryngeal papillomas can be given IV and now there is one center in USA which has started trials for oral slofovir as well. Dosages 0.5 ml in 3.5 ml. Uh, the maximum volume injected in vocal cord should be 5 milligram. It was developed basically for cytomegalovirus induced retinitis pigmentosa, but now we are using, many centers are using it for uh, recurrent laryngeal papillomas. What we follow, remove the papillomas in the same sitting, 
inject telophobia to the sites from which they are originating or we can see multiple sites so you can inject at multiple uh, sites the pseudophobia and they follow up with uh, video laryngoscopy but we inject them uh, after 6 weeks or if there is further recurrence earlier than that so this is one case actually uh, used to present with airway obstruction uh, every 4 to 6 uh, months and now he is really coming with only dysphonia and his airway uh, obstruction has been relieved with three procedures of cirrhophobia uh because you map uh, map is a recombinant immunized monoclonal antibody uh this is uh, actually endothelial growth factor uh, and it inhibits an angiogenic neoplastic uh, growth so basically uh, angiogenesis is what the property it has can be given or it has to, uh, we give it intra lesional after removal of the papilloma to those sites from which we see uh, the papilloma arising from process has been prescribed it's very readily available in indian indian market and uh, it has both uh, showed good results uh, i'm going to show you further in the slides we already have uh, done observation study in 25 patients in which we have used ktp laser with intra lesional bicasu zumar and we have seen that the recurrence rate has been definitely increased in all these patients so we have published the article which compare uh, uh, micro instrument removal with co2 laser removal then maybe a scanner mode of the co2 remission in juvenile onset recurrent respiratory papillomas uh, ktp laser and bicasu uh, bicasu zumar trial and again a zero typing of uh, the patients with having laryngeal papilloma Uh, as we go along, uh, we are using. I mean, we have seen the laser being used for the benign lesions, and more so in papillomas. What we have seen. Just to summarize, what would be the uh, laser safety limitations and risk factors of using lasers in the laryngoscopy in the uh, uh, what we call lesions, fire hazards for its uh, electrical plus chemical uh, combination. chemical hazards and plume which can carry papilloma virus to the surgeons it has got acular hazards with the reflected beam it also has skin burns when you are using the laser uh, the, uh, uh, without any microscope electrical hazards are there you can have non target strikes on the leaf teeth or subglottis we can have local hemorrhage or bleeding if the vessels are more than 0.5 uh, mm again a scar formation webs and fibrosis okay, because uh, thermal damage could be to complications uh, like a complete colic stenosis interarate nerve fixation posterior glottic web uh, you have to take safety precaution while using laser uh, in laryngeal uh, surgeries basically specialize endotracheal tubes with cotonoids to protect the thermal damage uh, covering the patient eyes and face with the wet gauze suction drive to clear the plume of the lasers and the reflective instruments and the scopes and train technicians okay uh, i think uh, we have up with the time uh, Uh, we move ahead and uh, maybe in the uh, next 10 minutes uh, main principles of sulcus vocalis why i have taken this topic because we see more and more cases in our outpatient who come in with change in voice and have got phonetic gap with sulcus vocalis 
the incidence of these patients in some centers have been put down to around 34 patients of all approaching voice clinic have got sulcus vocalis. So the incidence is very high. So we should know what really is sulcus vocalis. Very difficult to treat, but what are the really options available? How to assess these patients and uh, uh, offer uh, different approaches? So basically, this is derangement of the vibratory function of the vocal cord, causing uh, insufficiency of the glottis, significant dysphonia. What is it basically anatomically? It is a focal invasionation of the epithelium into the SLP down into the ligament or the muscle, vocalis muscle. Uh, mucosal bridge, again, there is a strip of epithelium uh, which comes on the edge of the vocal cord and uh, derange the mucosal wave. We are going to see this in the uh, images. There could be vocal fold scar itself because of uh, generalized fibrogastric disorders uh, like some infection, like diphtheria, which is going to give you scar or any trauma, vocal fold trauma. Could be intubation, could be external trauma. It could be congenital, sulcus vocalis and can be or mainly we see patients who has got phonotrauma. The singers who sing in very high pitch or politicians I have seen uh, developing uh, sulcus vocalis. Some inflammatory procedures also can result in sulcus vocalis. Again, vocal faults scarring because of phonotrauma, surgical trauma because of uh, laser again, uh, intubation, radiation, again, some trauma, thermal trauma, inflammatory procedures um, can give scarring uh, of the vocal fold and less of the mucosal waves and dysphonia. Uh, how to assess basically auditory, you hear the voice and you know there is a sulcus vocalis, breathy voice, strained voice, effortful voice because they have to close their glottis, approximate the vocal cords, so they have to put a lot of effort. It's a congenital, we are going to see some clips, starts from childhood and they develop again the false cord edema, uh, ventricular phonation. To check the level of invagination, we have to do stroboscopy to see the level of or the amplitude of the mucosal wave. We are going to see or you can do microlingoscopy and microendoscopy to palpate, see the scar how it is going deep into the epithelium. So see, now these are the layers of the vocal cord. Try to understand this. This is the superficial epithelium. This is the superficial or this is the lamina propria. And this is the vocalis muscle. So a dip into the epithelium would result in a sulcus. So dip, this dip would, would not go down into the lamina propria. So this is what is called as type 1 or this is physiological. This image you can uh, appreciate a bit but quite superficial. When it goes down into the lamina propria, then it is called as sulcus vergature type 2a or type 2 in some classification. You can see now it has gone down into the lamina propria and touching the ligament. And when really it goes down and adheres to the ligament, then it is sulcus vocalis. See, the sulcus vocalis has formed here. Uh, see, this is physiological. When it goes down, uh, into the liga ligament, uh, uh, type 2, and when it is uh, going down into the vocalis muscle, then uh, it, is, it becomes type 3 or type 2 3 in some cases, but basically type 1, type 2 and type 3 as per the deepening of the sulcus. And this deepening, how you are going to see them on clinical examination with the stroboscopy, some mild reduction in the waves, reduction in the mucosal waves, 
and in this there will be absence of the mucosal vein difficult to treat as they go deeper into bronchitis uh, muscle this is a mucosal bridge uh, case of mucosal bridge this is called as a pseudo sulcus uh, that is a subclotic edema uh, mucosal bridge uh, we are going to go for dermatitis i am showing this for a purpose of uh, diagnosis when you are taken the patient under anesthesia and checking uh, the sulcus uh, so it could be a mucosal bridge also so you can try to elevate uh, it with the forceps or a probe this can be taken care of by, by anti reflux medicines and what is the difference the sulcus vocal is always is the membranous vocal cord and when it goes beyond the membranous vocal cord down then it is uh pseudosulcus or subglottic edema so this is congenital sulcus vocalis see how harsh is the voice see how strained and harsh and mm. effortful is the voice because of the phonetic this is compensatory ventricular phonation of a congenital sulcus vocalis Uh, see now this mucosal waves. So you can see some mucosal wave. That means the invagination is not deep into the vocalis muscle. How this is going to help you in planning the treatment? With medialization, you can hope of getting some relief or some glottic closure, some return of mucosal wave with the surgery. But if you don't see any mucosal waves on stroboscopy, there these patients are very hard to treat only uh, medialization may not help this is after fat augmentation of the same patient what you have achieved is structural repair that is closure of the glottic aperture medical management these are anatomic changes difficult to treat medically but you can give uh, medical management that is anti reflux anti allergy medicines uh, vocal hygiene has to be taught to them to reduce the phonotrauma which was uh, maybe the origin of the uh, sulcus and again uh, check the reversibility anti reflux medicines surgical management again what we are opting for is glottic closure that is structural approach and biological approach that is you have to regain the mucosal wave or what we say as a soft tissue regeneration when you understand that structural would be in with injection augmentation you can just inject fat into the paraglottis or put in some fat or fascia in the uh, superficial lamina propria there are different techniques but again this is structural that is you achieve glottic closure some people have also advised bilateral thyroplasty just to close the glottis so this is structural approach biological approach that is to regain the mucosal waves soft tissue regeneration so there are injection of steroids hyaluronic acid cell therapy stem cell therapy growth factors have been tried in japan with again um experimental basis there are different growth factors but this hepatocyte growth factor is available in the market in india also the advantage of this injection is this can be given as an opd procedure you can inject the vocal cord with this growth factor uh, multiple sittings three to six sittings they advise uh, but this is available in indian market also and you can use this for these patients for regaining of the mucosal wave Again, fascia implantation uh, may stimulate uh, neck fibroblast and will improve the vibrations. Vaporize with the pulse dial laser. In the Nath Mangeshkar Hospital, we are in uh, phase two trial into a research of developing one collagen product from UK uh, for treatment of sulcus vocalis. Again, biological approach. how to deal with this patient so fat augmentation with a sickle knife to check and elevate the epithelium 
which has been fibrosed down into the ligament or the deeper layers to elevate it create some space for fat to go in either you can inject fat in the paraglottic space or you can inject the fat into the lamina propria itself medialize it you can do the same thing with the laser also you can elevate the flap or the epithelium by cutting it with the lasers by cutting it with the laser you can elevate and you can inject and put back the flap with the help of lamina propria uh, uh, fibrin glue again one of the published article uh, or the uh, fat augmentation in cases of sulcus vocalis uh, i would like to thank and close uh, my talk on this uh, particular two topics which are difficult to deal but there are good number of patients which visit our uh, voice clinic uh, just to know secular cyst and laryngocils we are going to deal in our uh, next forthcoming sessions thank you very much thank you sir that was a wonderful and informative lecture now moving on to the last lecture of the day that is office brace procedures it will be presented by dr brandon baird thank you so much again for having me dr gandhi and uh, thank you all for your attention uh, and kind of hanging on during the last part of this lecture here um we're going to talk today about office based procedures in laryngology and I, I tried to keep the topic very broad uh, there's a lot to go over uh, and there are a lot of different procedures that we do in our clinic uh, at the university of chicago that allows us to kind of give patients better access to care uh, allow for a decreased use of general anesthesia for these patients and uh, allows for cost savings for both the hospital and the patient so really quickly an outline for what we're going to talk about. First, we'll talk about a history of office-based procedures in laryngology, specifically laryngology in general. And then we'll discuss the anesthesia for these types of procedures and what's necessary to be able to operate in the office and to be able to do these uh, procedures. Next, we'll talk about vocal cord injections in the office, and that includes both subepithelial superficial injections, as well as the deep injections for medialization of the vocal folds. We'll talk about office-based laser surgery, and Dr. Gandhi already alluded to in a little bit of it, uh, but we'll just kind of talk about what some, uh, some of the uh, considerations for office-based surgery might be. We'll touch on office-based biopsy of the vocal folds and larynx. We'll discuss EMG-guided Botox injections, discuss dysphagia for a bit, uh, as well as uh, balloon dilations of the esophagus. And if we have a little bit of time, we can talk a little bit about a uh, project that's near and dear to my heart, uh, which is the ergonomics of office-based procedures. So um, the advantages of office-based procedures are pretty many, but um, I'll, I kind of condense them down to four, four key points. By moving the page, uh, procedures out of the OR, you have significant cost savings. You can do a higher number of procedures per day. You don't have to wait for OR turnover or instrumentation turnover. It can be done without the risks of general anesthesia, and it's easier for patients regarding scheduling and specifically for patients undergoing recurrent procedures like those who have recurrent respiratory papilloma needing uh, recurrent procedures. So let's talk about a little bit of the history of the office-based procedures. Uh, initially, these procedures were, uh, or sorry, excuse me, initially Greek and Roman um, uh, scientists, quote unquote, uh, looked into the oropharynx as a potential um, uh, way of understanding what is going on anatomically with the voice and hearing. Julius Caesarius kind of uh, expanded upon that and authored a book in 1600 so called The Anatomy of Voice and Hearing, where he discussed uh, and suggested perhaps some of the anatomic basis of uh, voicing and swallowing. Um, others throughout the 19th century detailed the neuroanatomy of the larynx and other sort of anatomic uh, key features. Uh, Duchor Chret was the first one to describe passive vibration of the vocal cords as a way to generate sound, although he had no way of actually identifying this. There was no endoscopy at the time, but he, he postulated this based on anatomic and cadaveric specimen. Um, this unique interest in the voice and sort of laryngeal anatomy uh, kind of set the stage for expansion of technology uh, to diagnose and treat voice disorders. An early intervention was actually performed in the office. So you kind of want to lay this framework of starting in the office. And then as technology became sort of, you'll see in the next couple of centuries, technology became about to be able to operate on the vocal cords 
in uh, the OR, the OR became sort of the primary arena, but now we're starting to move back more towards the office because of the things I mentioned before. So to be able to operate and to be able to do procedures in the larynx, you first have to be able to see the larynx. And so Philip Bozzini was the first to expand an understanding of anatomy and specifically internal cavities by creation, uh, by using the creation of endoscopes. Basically he used a light source, a candle and directed mirrors for allow, uh, allowing visualization into the body. Most of them were sort of uh, reflective uh, evaluations. Um, the first person to kind of discuss or create the lar laryngoscope was Bill Baddington. He's a British uh, scientist, and he scientist and the laryngoscope retracted the tongue and allowed for visualization of the larynx using a mirror uh, and the uh, direct sunlight for illumination. The father of um, you know, sorry to interrupt uh, you, sir. Sorry to interrupt you, sir. Uh, sure. But your mm -hmm. screen is not shared, sir. You're not able to see your screen. Oh, thank you so much. Sorry, thank you for reminding me that. You would, you would think after um, after um, two years of pandemic, I, I would have uh, <laughs> been able to. Here, is this better? Can you see this? Yes, yes. Now we can okay. see. It. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, Philip Bozzini was the first to describe the use of endoscopes uh, using a light source and uh, the mirrors. And then uh, Benjamin B uh, Babington described the uh, first laryngoscope using a uh, sun for illumination. Manuel Garcia was a music prof professor and he was sort of credited as the father of laryngology. He created a device that was similar to Babington's and published the observations of the human voice in which he first described the mobility of the vocal folds and posited that the um, generation of the voice comes from vibration of those vocal cords. Um, routine evaluation of the patients with scopes uh, were limited at the time by lack of anesthesia and also dependable light source. This came along towards the end of the 1800s as, um, uh, as Alexander, sorry, excuse me, Thomas Edison uh, developed the electronic light source and as the uh, advent or addition of uh, anesthesia came about. So this is Bo uh, Bozzini's uh, endoscope. Uh, this is Manuel Garcia. So Kohler uh, uh, in 1884 uh, discovered the use of cocaine for um, topical anesthesia and hemostasis, which improved the, the diagnosis and intervention of these patients. A number of other people applied them to the larynx. Uh, Jelenic was the first to apply to the larynx and remove a polyp uh, transorally. Um, Prior to the use of cocaine, uh, patients were learned had to learn hab um, habituation. Basically, someone would go to their house multiple times uh, over the course of a week to train them uh, to overcome their gag reflex so they could actually evaluate the larynx. Horace Green was one of the first to excise laryngeal neoplasm under direct laryngoscopy using a spatula and a curved tenaculum. And some other uh, forefathers, Jacob Salas Cohen, made advances in laryngeal surgery, uh, buttressed by the advances in the uh, techniques of indirect laryngoscopy that were sort of uh, coming about at the end of the uh, at the end of the 1800s. So this is horror screen. And then finally, the fiber optic revolution really kind of laid the groundwork and foundation for what we're able to do in the office now. Carl Storrs developed the first the flexible fiber optic gastroscope in 1960, which then led to the development of rigid telescopes and endoscopes that uh, were used uh, in the OR at the time and also used for awake patients transorally. Uh, the flexible fiber optic endoscopes were the result of John Ty um, Tyndale. He was a, a scientist who helped describe the optics of glass rods, which allowed for the bending of light um, potentially around the corner of the nasopharynx. And initial fiber optic gastro gastroscopes were developed in 1956, and then subsequently a bronchoscope was developed in 66, and then um, a transnasal laryngoscope came along for the first time in 1968. Chip technology came along in the late 1960s and evolved into the 90s and the 2000s, allowing for improved visualization of the larynx. So that was kind of a whirlwind history, historical tour. Um, finally, flexible laryngoscopy made its way back to the office in the 1900s, the 20th century, with improved visualization for, laryng for laryngoscopy um, using the felt flexible fiber optic scope. It allowed for procedures to make their way back to the OR from the office. For instance, Brunings, who first described vocal fold injections with paraffin at the time, um, in the OR at the time, uh, was the sort of um, uh, forefather of what we now consider sort of office-based uh, laryngoscopy and laryngoplasty, which is sort of a very um, common mainstay of our, of our practice, our procedural practice. Arnold capitalized on that and injected Teflon. Both of those materials were found to be inadequate because of their development of either paraffinomas or Teflon granulomas. Uh, Dito described a series in the 1970s 
Um, the Ford injector set and set came along in the 1980s, and we'll talk about that in a little bit too. And then Paul Ward finally described the use of uh, a transcervical method in 1985 to inject uh, and medialize the vocal folds. Lasers have come a long way since they were first introduced. Um, you know, as Dr. Gandhi pointed out, um, we use many different types of lasers within our practice. The CO2 laser was first uh, invented in 1958 and a pulse system was adapted actually by Yako at Boston University in 1965. Stuart Strong, uh, Charles Vaughn and Yako went on to describe the use of the CO2 laser for the resection of early body ca uh, cancer in patients in the OR. Um, in the 1990s, Macmillan, as well, well as others, uh, Stephen Zaitel, et cetera, uh, developed the use of um, flexible uh, laser fibers that could be used to treat papilloma and dysplasia in the, um, in the, uh, the larynx using a flexible channel scope. Um, and over the past uh, year or two, um, the development of the blue light laser has allowed for, um, has allowed for uh, the um, advancement of this technology into the 21st century. Um, finally, um, esophageal dilation has been around for most of the 20th century. Either esophageal or airway dilation has been described by many of our early pioneers. However, in 2007, um, Rees et al. described the unsedated transnasal balloon dilation system in the prox proximal esophagus. So it sort of served as a great, um, a great launching point for, for uh, something uh, specifically in an area that hadn't really been uh, uncovered before. So kind of moving ahead from history over to how we do our office-based procedures, the, the key, as we know from Kohler at all, is that you have to be able to anesthetize the patient well enough to be able to do the procedures. So there are different approaches to anesthesia. But essentially, your approach to anesthesia should follow the, the sort of um, the, the following um, rubric or rules. So for transnasal procedures, um, as most of you know, you topicalize the nose with a combination of oxy oxymetazolin and a, um, and a sodium channel blocker, either tetracaine or lidocaine. I prefer the 2.25% oxymetazolin and um, 4 or 3% lidocaine combination. A single spray bottle um, or pressure pressurized atomizer can be used. Unfortunately, in the setting of COVID, um, there are concerns from uh, various infection control um, bodies about the, the sterility uh, of those pressure, pressurized atomizers um, because of the backflow of uh, aerosol, uh, aerosol particles. Um, I use them, but I sterilize them after each patient um, for, for when I need them. They tend to work a lot better than single spray bottles to topicalize the nose. And the, uh, they do a good job of uh, topicalizing the oral cavity and oral pharynx, oral pharynx as well. Most in-office procedures with a flexible laryngoscope use a working channel. And through the working channel, you can actually apply a fair amount of lidocaine as well. I'll usually apply about anywhere from two to five mLs of the lidocaine into the epiglottis, supraglottis structure, as well as onto the vocal cords. And while applying the vocal cord through the, uh, sorry, while applying the lidocaine through the working channel, I have the patients um, hold an E, a long E. This is something that's been um, uh, coined as the laryngeal gargle by a, 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 a Hagugian uh, at uh, University of Michigan. For transoral procedures, um, we spray the base of the tongue uh, and the palate and the posterior pharynx with topical cetokine spray, which is a combination of benzocaine, uh, butambin, and tetracaine. We also can apply nasal anesthesia, specifically if we're going to plan on also doing a uh, flexible laryngoscopy. And you may also consider the addition of nebulized or aerosolized 4% lidocaine transorally. So with the atomizer bottle, I'll typically start with the tip of the nozzle outside of the mouth. I will turn on the uh, pressurized machine. I will have the patient just inhale with the tip of the bottle outside of the mouth. I'll do that for about five seconds. Then I'll go a little bit further into the oral cavity. I'll have them inhale um, kind of quick shallow breaths rather than deep breaths um, to make sure that it gets sort of maximum time on the larynx. And then I will continue to advance into the aspirating tip to sort of just of the posterior oropharynx and I'll aim towards the glottis while the patient phonates in a long E to make sure that the superior aspect of the cords are, are appropriately topicalized. Um, so the question is, when have you reached appropriate topical anesthesia? Um, so there are three different things that can help help you determine whether or not your topical anesthesias have been affected. Uh, if you've uh, been able to mitigate or uh, abrogate the cough reflex while you're spraying the lidocaine, 
and you likely uh, you you've done your, your your due diligence. If you've gotten rid of the gag reflex as well, that's also likely you've gotten you've done your due diligence. And then oftentimes, if you're using the flexible scope, you can palpate the epiglottis, so the base of tongue, the posterior glottis, the, base, uh, the vocal folds, and you won't notice any specific reactivity. That's also another indication that you've topicalized enough. Um, once appropriately anesthetized, uh, tracheal bronchoscopy should be able to be performed. So you should be able to get through the cords once that happens. You want to make sure that you tell your patients that they should be NPO for about one to two hours after this topical anesthetic. Other adjuncts to, uh, adjuncts to consider, uh, in addition to just topical spray, may be uh, various blocks. So the superior laryngeal nerve block is a really good um, option um, that I use for a lot of my patients that have hypersensitive uh, larynx, laryngeas. Um, what we do is you're palpating for the thyrohyoid space here, this little space there, and you're looking to inject right sort of here where the uh, internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve enters the larynx right here. Um, this provides a nice sort of block uh, of sensation and actually helps the patients tolerate the procedures a lot better. I'll inject about one ml of one to two mls of a one uh, percent lidocaine with epinephrine uh, into both sides and again tell the patients not to eat or drink for about an hour to two hours. Other considerations include the tracheal cutaneous block, which is where you look identifying the thyrohyoid, excuse me, uh, cricothyroid space. You're palpating and then you're injecting. You make sure you withdraw uh, air uh, through your needle to make sure that you're in the airway, and then you inject the lidocaine and have the patient cough to uh, aerosolize that uh, while they're while you're injecting. So let's talk briefly about vocal fold injections in the office. So typically um, there are uh, two kind of ways of thinking of, or two levels of vocal fold injections that we can think of. We can think of a medialization laryngoplasty to help move the vocal fold closer to midline to help with the patients that have vocal fold paralysis. Or you can think of a therapeutic vocal fold subepithelial injection in the office. As Dr. Gandhi alluded to, um, things like platelet-rich plasma and fibroblasts for patients that have sulcus or scar, uh, the bevacizumab or avastin for patients that have papilloma. These are all sort of therapeutic options to, to address patients uh, in the uh, office and also to increase the number, uh, I guess, the time uh, between treatment for some of these papilloma patients. So with regard to the medialization laryngoplasty, there are many ways to skin a cat. There's a per-oral per approach, there's percutaneous, there's trans cricothyroid approach, there's trans thyrohyoid approach, and there's trans thyroid cartilage approach. And I'll show them all of these a little bit later. And there's also a way to inject endoscopically as well through, the, um, through a working channel. With regard to injectable materials for the medialization laryngoplasty, there are a number of them, and they've all been sort of described and you know uh, reported ad nauseum. The ones that sort of um, are, are most re recently used uh, are Restylane, Hyaluron form, which is hyaluronic acid, Symetra, which I don't believe is on the market anymore. It's a um, micronized dermis, uh, carboxymethyl cellulose, which went under the name of um, Polarin gel for the longest time, and now is Radius gel. There's the trial uh, options, and then there's the semi-permanent permanent options, which uh, mostly people are using calcium hydroxyl appetite, um, which has some of its own drawbacks with regard to application and ease of, uh, of injection. Um, looking at um, those, all of those absorbable materials, um, Zytels et al. did a, an evaluation uh, in dog models of the inflammatory response, the resonance, uh, excuse me, the residence time, and the, um, the clearance of um, those materials um, that were previously described, uh, and looked to see which one sort of was the best candidate for medialization. And based on his st study, he identified that carboxymethyl cellulose did not localize well in the paraglottic region. Additionally, it, it elicited a robust inflammatory response with the clearance of macrophages and, um, and uh, a short residence time. So uh, basically carboxymethyl cellulose only stuck around for about a week or so. In previous studies, uh, it's been sort of posited that it's, it would last for about six weeks to even longer, but um, this study identified that it might kind of be uh, resorbed more quickly than previously thought. Hyaluronic acid, on the other hand, contrastingly demonstrated it localized well to the paraglottic space. It demonstrated good tissue compatibility, and the residence time was about three months or so, which um, was, uh, you know, um, a, a very um, 
promising, uh, promising uh, option for medialization. And again, to talk about calcium hydroxylapatite, um, previous studies have, uh, or previous uh, literature from the, the um, uh, company that makes it has suggested that perhaps it lasts for about six months to a year. But we've found um, and anecdotally that a lot of our patients that get injected with calcium hydroxylapatite actually continue to uh, demonstrate a presence of, of that uh, injectable material long after six months to a year. And even worse, if it's injected into the superficial lamina propria in the subepithelial space, it can lead to disruption with regard to the pliability and mucosal wave, which can cause uh, its own uh, series of problems in hoarseness, which then might need to be removed in the operating room later. So uh, vocal fold medialization, let's talk about the indications. Uh, this is sort of the, the, is the plan that I go off of. And so it's indicated for an acute vocal cord paralysis, which I consider to be less than one year. For patients that have, uh, say, a transient injury after thyroid surgery or potentially a stretch injury, I like to give the patients a full year to demonstrate improvement in the mobility of the vocal fold. Um, typically, this is done in the office. It's done either transoral or it can be done transnasal with a thyrohyoid or cricothyroid injection. Um, prior to transoral injection, you should evaluate the oral pharyngeal gag reflex and also the anatomy to make sure that you have appropriate room over the base of tongue and that the patient doesn't have a significant gag that would preclude, preclude them from being a good candidate. For transcervical injection, you wanna make sure that the patient has easily palpable landmarks and that they don't have a significant neck or any uh, goiter that would pretend, potentially uh, impact your ability to do an injection. You also wanna make sure that the patient is cooperative and able to follow commands. This won't work on your neuro patients um, if they can't follow commands. A lot of patients have anxiety prior to our office-based procedures, and a lot of times an anxiolytic or a benzodiazepine, such as diazepam, can be helpful in assisting with procedures. You want to make sure that you start slow and um, build up from there. You want them to sign the consent forms prior to taking the benzodiazepine, and you want them to take the benzo about an hour or so before the uh, procedure. Um, for a lot of these procedures, and the vocal fold injection specifically, you can continue anticoagulation during the procedure, so long as the INR isn't super therapeutic. If the patient has a significantly higher um, um, or is significantly anticoagulated, you'll want to make sure that you um, make sure they're, they're in the therapeutic range before going to, to do injections uh, or other procedures. So positioning and prep. So you want the patient to be seated, slightly leaning forward, kind of in the sniffing position with their head extended. Um, you want to make sure that you give sufficient topical anesthesia, as we talked about before. A lot of times an emesis basin or a Yankauer suction can be helpful to help prevent secretions, um, or sorry, excuse me, help to address secretions and can give the patient um, a little bit of control if they have a hyper sort of secretory response to the spray. Video tower should be ideally across from the provider so they're not turning as they're doing the injection. So this is the equipment that's used for the transoral injection. Okay, so this is a Ford injector needle or injector uh, cannula. It basically consists of three different parts, this handpiece, this injector cannula, and this washer here. Oftentimes, this will come with two different cannulas. For the second cannula, you can hook it up to a 10cc syringe that's filled with lidocaine, and you can apply the lidocaine prior to doing an injection uh, to do the laryngeal gargoyle, as I described before. And oftentimes you can transfer whatever injectable material you have into a one cc syringe. I find that the BD, bio, uh, BD Biosciences syringes are a little bit better in terms of their plunger. They don't turn or twist as much, so it's easier to push and depress the uh, injectable material when you're, um, when you're injecting. Uh, and then finally, you'll need either a rigid scope or a flexible scope. The advantage to the rigid scope is that you can do this with one practitioner. Um, uh, you can do this alone on your own. With a flexible scope, you need at least two providers, one to hold the scope and one to do the injection. Um, with a rigid, you can either have the patient hold their own tongue or you can have an assistant hold their tongue, um, but the assistant doesn't have to be trained to you know, have any specialized understanding of, of uh, laryngoscopy. So the technique goes like this. Essentially, this is describing a trans, uh, a trans uh, oral um, transnasal um, viewing or assisted injection. So you can see this is the Ford injector needle. It goes over the tongue, under the palate, as the, someone is looking from above. Now, if you were using a rigid scope, you would just go in with a rigid scope and you go in with the needle. And then the trick here is as you're going in, you actually have to lift the end of the uh, the, the, the the hold handle part of the um, of the cannula up and 
towards the nose almost so you can get the fiber, oh, excuse me, the cannula to bend around the posterior um, oropharynx and the base of tongue and also around the epiglottis. You want to make sure that you're visualizing the whole way through after you've gone beyond the palate and so that you can direct the uh, injection where it needs to go. It should ideally go into the paraglottic space. You'll want it to make, you want to make sure that you're lateral enough to make sure that you're in the paraglottic space and specifically in the muscle and not in the subepithelial space. Again, for most of these materials, if you inject them in the subepithelial space, you can create some disruption of the mucosal wave and some voice abnormalities. Now, with regard to transcervical techniques, there are a number of different techniques that have been described. First, um, the, um, the cricothyroid technique was described in the 80s, as I mentioned before, by Paul Ward. This is done with a needle um, palpating through um, the, uh, the cricothyroid space and, and membrane uh, and using sort of uh, an upward angle towards the vocal cord that you hope to inject. Uh, this is done in somewhat of a blind fashion. Most people will look from above with a flexible laryngoscope uh, to make sure that they're not injecting too superficially or they're not in, uh, out of place. And they'll also sort of see what response they have to the injection. Some people choose to do a trans uh, thyroid cartilage injection, which gives you a little bit more of an on, angle on uh, to kind of make sure that you're getting in the right place. And then recently described out of, I believe the mass uh, ionary group has been the sort of thyrohyoid uh, injection, which involves uh, using a needle from uh, above where you sort of actually bend the needle tip here by about um, uh, 120 degrees. And then you bend here again, 120 degrees to go over the thyroid notch and as you're visualizing from above, you'll be able to see where you're injecting um, a little bit more easily than these other options, which uh, have a buried needle. Um, all of these are great uh, ways to overcome a patient that has gag reflex if you still want to do the mutilization in the office. So with regard to therapeutic subepithelial vocal fold injection, this is a really interesting and neat area that's sort of really expanding over the past couple, five to 10 years or so. With the addition of things like the autologous fibroblasts or vocal cord scars, this study came out two years or three years ago now, um, looking at using autologous fibroblasts to activate regeneration of super, super superficial lamina propria, as well as looking at plate, platelet, -rich, excuse me, platelet rich plasma for vocal fold scar and then bevacizumab. There are a number of studies that are sort of coming along over the past five to 10 years that sort of help us um, treat patients and act as adju uh, adjuvant therapy for patients that have vo uh, voice disorders or pathology. So next, we're going to move to office-based laser surgery. Uh, Dr. Gandhi did a great job of um, reviewing a lot of the fundamentals of laser surgery, so we don't have to go into too much detail here, but I'm going to briefly just discuss sort of some of the considerations for treating patients in the office. Office-based laser surgery is much more convenient compared to procedures under general. Patients may return to clinic um, on their own, and they may also leave clinic on their own without having to have someone drive them. Safety is enhanced because they're not exposed to the general anesthetic that they would be uh, exposed to in the OR, and recurrent disease is more easily treated with serial treatments um, with a laser in the office. So patient positioning and prep, again, for all of these procedures, cooperative patients uh, are, are kind of the norm that's necessary. And additionally, without a significant gag reflex is also helpful. You may consider an anxiolytic. Uh, it's, it's vital that you visualize the vocal folds and the endolarynx completely before getting started. If for whatever reason the patient has significant arytenoid hooding or has a significantly large um, false vocal folds that sort of uh, cover up a lot of the vocal, uh, the true fold, it may be difficult for you to perform these procedures. Lasers that are used in the office include the CO2 laser, which has a wavelength of 10,600 nanometers, which has water as its chromophore, which means that it's indiscriminate in its target tissue. Um, historically, this has sort of been thought of the reason that it can cause some thermal injury and damage when it's being used, but uh, Dr. Gandhi identified sort of the uh, new uh, options that have been used for, or excuse me, the new technology that's come along with the CO2 laser. The thulium laser has a, a wavelength of 2013 nanometers and also has water as a chromophore, but it has improved hemostasis compared to the CO2. And then finally, the pulse dye laser um, has a wavelength of 585 nanometers, and that uses oxyhemoglobin as its chromophore. Uh, and that was sort of the predecessor or the sort of um, the, the kind of the, the initial uh, gold standard that then sort of led way to the uh, potassium titanyl phosphate laser, the KTP laser, which has a wavelength of 532 nanometers. 
and has um, oxyhemoglobin as its chromophore for as well. Uh, and it typically has a longer pulse width, which allows it to be a little bit more selective in its photoangelysis of vessels. Um, I use the KTP nearly exclusively in the office um, as I feel that it does a better job of um, uh, treating disease and also does a better job of, um, uh, of preserving underlying superficial lamina propria and, and sparing normal vocal fold um, epithelium and, and mucosa. So what's the technique? So you want the patient sitting in, the, uh, in a seated position with an appropriate uh, application of uh, anesthetic. You'll make sure that the fiber optic um, scope can visualize the larynx. You pass the fiber through the working channel of the scope um, and you want the tip of the fiber to be about one to two centimeters beyond the end of the scope. Typically, I'll place my fiber through a fiber holder, holder or fiber sheath. Um, there's one made by Fiberlays, as well as a number of other places. A German company, I think, is the Fiberlays company, um, and they're pretty inexpensive. Obviously, eyewear should be worn by all in the room. Um, suction can be, it should be available. Uh, sometimes it's performed through the scope. However, some will like to use a separate suction. It's easy enough to use a trach suction, a chim chimney suction in the other nares um, to suction out the, uh, the nasopharynx and thus the oropharynx and larynx. Contact and non-contact modes are, are uh, possibly uh, used for, to treat the lesions, and I'll show a video in just a second of how that, that's done. And then intermittent gentle suctioning with the flexible laryngoscope um, can allow for um, removal of treated disease, treated disease and uh, exposure of the underlying uh, untreated disease that then can be ablated with a laser once more. Typically after surgery or after these office-based surgeries, we'll keep patients on voice rest for anywhere from two to seven days. I tend to do more two days just because uh, we're discovering that voice rest um, over longer periods of time can sometimes cause other um, other uh, detrimental side effects such as muscle tension, compensatory behavior, et cetera. So I tend to stick to three, two to three days. So this is a video of a patient that had a papilloma actually emanating from their um, left anterior ventricle and false forward um, true cord area. Um, they were treated with a KTP laser and then subsequent to that, they had an injection of a vastum in the subepithelial space. So um, this is a great kind of um, video kind of wraps up the last two discussions here. Board. This is the application of the uh, topical medication here. The laryngeal gargle, as Dr. Hukidian says. So that's a little bit of the light. Can you see that by having them phonate, you're uh, causing it to aerosolize and, and putting on the cords directly? And then you can see the papilloma there. So I'm hitting on the the ventricle. So I will fast forward a little bit. So here's our laser fiber you'll see here coming out of the scope in just a bit. And so what's going to be used here is both contact and non-contact modes. So this is the contact mode and you'll see that the over time, the papilloma starts to blanch, and that's what the ideal the ideal um, uh, change color change that you expect to see. Fast forward a little bit here, and start to see some of the blanching there. One of the considerations here is that you're uh, having to deal with a lot of variables. The patient is moving, obviously. You're trying to treat a three-dimensional surface with a two-dimensional screen. You have uh, things that get in the way, such as the false boards, uh, especially when the patient uh, is uh, bearing down or is feeling the, uh, feeling the laser a little bit more. Uh, and so you have to kind of be mindful of that and be able to stop the laser. You can see there is occasionally there is a little bit of collateral um, uh, laser hits. It doesn't have too much implication, again, because the laser is not significantly absorbed by the false cords, but it is something that's important to kind of keep in mind and be aware of. So oftentimes, once you've treated like that, you can go ahead and suction, which is what she's doing here. You can suction off the superficial layer, the, the uh, superficial layer that's been decoupled. And usually once that's done, uh, you can do an injection of the vastin, which is uh, here, the uh, cannula, the portic cannula, they're dripping a little bit of 
4% lidocaine into the larynx to topicalize once more. This patient has a little bit of a gag reflex, so they're a little bit more sensitive than the normal patient. So a little topical medication causes the patient to cough. And then here's an injection of um, the Vastin, the Vasizumab. And really what you're trying to do is just go underneath the epithelium and expand the subepithelial space. And this can all be done in clinic. This is all something that, you know, is very easy for patients that tolerate it. And we find that even the Avastin itself can cause some regression of papilloma without necessarily having an ablative procedure. So some people will just come in for recurrent injections of Avastin and their disease will actually be kept at bay. It's a pretty incredible drug. So that's, that's, uh, that's that in a nutshell. Um, one of the new actors that's coming along is the blue light laser. This has a wavelength of 445 nanometers. It also uses uh, oxyhemoglobin as its chromophore. Um, productions limited to, uh, sorry, production limitations with the KTP have led to a need for alternatives for the Aura device or the KTP system. So the blue light laser, it's a dial-up system. Preliminary studies have identified that its depth of penetration and effect is similar to that of KTP. Um, I've used it in the OR. Um, it's, it seems like it's similar, but I, I don't think it has the same um, ablative technique or power uh, ability or power of the, the KTP just yet. Um, I'll have Dr. Gandhi weigh in on that after we finish and see what his thoughts are on that. Um, with regard to preoperative planning and technique um, for uh, biopsy, um, with similar setup to awake laser surgery, you want to make sure that you topicalize the patient very well. And then there are two approaches. This here that you see on the um, left, on the right hand side, excuse me, is the most common approach that's used nowadays. Nowadays, it's the transnasal biopsy through a working channel. A flexible scope is used. You use a 1.8 millimeter endoscopic biopsy forceps and you grab and pull. It's more easily tolerated by patients than the per, per oral biopsy. Um, essentially, this is done with a rigid scope and a long curved biopsy forceps. You have the patient hold their own tongue while the surgeon visualizes the lesion and pulls the uh, biopsy out through the oral cavity. This is the biopsy forceps. It kind of goes in over the base of tongue here, around the epiglottis, and then down to where the larynx is. Um, these instruments are uh, variable in their utility. I think sometimes they don't um, you know, they don't work as well for certain types of patients that have large, large tongue bases, et cetera. Um, so we're moving away from some of the office praise, transoral, transnasal surgery, and going towards more of the uh, EMG-guided procedures. So let's talk briefly about Botox injection. It's effective for spasmodic dysphonia in select patients that have vocal cord tremor, for patients that have cricopharyngeal achalasia, and for those that have severe muscle tension, dysphonia, or functional voice disorders. Uh, botulism toxin is a neurotoxin that causes muscle paralysis. It inhibits the calcium dependent uh, inhibits calcium dependent excitosis and the release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. Um, it allows for recoverable weakness. Um, of specific muscles that are injected, um, the nervous system recovers the ability to release acetylcholine over time. Usually it's about three months or so that you can expect for an effect. So pre-procedure planning for these injections, and this is typically for me done entirely transorally. Uh, occasionally I will do a trans, uh, trans uh, excuse me, a transcervically. Occasionally I will do a transoral injection if I've had trouble identifying or getting a good result uh, with the EMG guidance, but for the most part, EMG maximizes um, the accuracy. So Botox typically in America here comes in uh, dilutions of 100 units, or excuse me, alicots of 100 units, which I'll dilute with four mLs of sterile normal saline. So I'll get a dilution of 2.5 units per 0.1 mL. This allows me to inject anywhere from 0.1 or less ml into the um, vocal folds to get a starting dose of anywhere from 0.625 to 2.5 units per vocal fold. Um, some patients prefer just one injection. So uh, in terms of local anesthesia, uh, using a transcutaneous block is something that I'll do for most patients, but some patients just want the one injection with the Botox and to be done. Um, for EMG, you have to make sure that you have a grounding electrode placed as well as a reference electrode placed and that placed. And then the needle itself is a, a needle that comes from the specific company that's, uh, that specializes in this. And the needle is the, 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 um, the, the stimulating electrode. Um, you'll go through the cricothyroid membrane and we'll show this in just a bit. And you'll have the patient phone it, phone it on E to make sure that you're in the correct space. If you get a signal, a higher EMG signal when they're phonating on E, you can be sure that you're in the um, uh, TA or the LCA complex. Uh, for patients that have um, a B ductor spasmodic dysphonia, 
um, they tend to benefit from an injection into the posterior cricorytenoid. And so what you do for those patients is you'll have them phonate and say E while you're injecting in a retrocricoid uh, approach or transcricoid approach. Um, we'll show that in just a second. Um, and they basically, they'll have no significant signal when they're phonating, but when you have them sniffing, you'll notice a signal increase. So that's a good way to make sure that you're in the PCA. And then you'll reevaluate the, evaluate the patient typically about a, a week later to see how the dose worked to make sure they have a characteristic breathy phase, which starts usually a week after the injection and tends to last for about two weeks. Um, and then you'll, um, uh, and, and then you'll, uh, if they have not had the characteristic breathy phase, you'll have them come back, you can do another injection, et cetera, or you'll see them back in about three months when the Botox should wear off. Again, this is a reminder about the transtracheal cutaneous block. So for Botox injections, this is the classic sort of approach here, sort of for the, the TA. So you're going in the cricothyroid membrane, you're directing it up towards the TA on either side, and you're confirming your placement with the, the EMG needle. For patients that have abductor, abductor spasmodic dysphonia, you're doing a retrocricoid approach. So you're rotating the larynx with your hand, and then you're going behind the cricoid behind the larynx, and you're injecting into the PCA, really, again, confirming that you're in the right place by having them sniff in. And then alternatives to that, if for whatever reason the patient has a large body habit is or difficulty with the rotation of the larynx is going directly through the cricoid cartilage, the posterior plate of the cricoid cartilage. This is somewhat some, uh, more difficult for some patients just because of the fact that they can have cal calcified um, cricoid, uh, cricoid. So it may be um, that you have to go with the retro, uh, retro cricoid approach. Alternatives for uh, Botox injections and some other uh, options include Botox injections in the, into the cricopharyngeal muscle. Um, this is for patients that have cricopharyngeal achalasia. Um, it's sort of um, a technique that, that's been coming along over the past five to 10 years. Um, it's helpful for, uh, at least in some of the initial um, descriptions uh, for, for getting patients uh, who have prior um, cricopharyngeal dysfunction or, or trouble to swallow again with a, a decreased disability rating, a swallow disability rating score and weaning of G-tube dependence. Um, the, the, this should be taken with a grain of salt as there's oftentimes some extravasation of Botox that can happen, which can potentially lead to a vocal fold paralysis in a patient that still has an intact larynx. I tend to save these for these pa the patients that have um, cricopharyngeal dysfunction or problems with dysphagia after total laryngectomy. Uh, this is done sort of in a similar fashion. You rotate, rotate the larynx, you inject as you're having the patient um, a swallow, and you'll notice that the tonically active cricopharyngeus loses its signal and then comes back after the swallow is over. So that's a good way to locate the, uh, the CP. So let's talk finally about dysphagia a little bit since we're on that kind of uh, topic. Uh, uh, a couple of office-based procedures that can be helpful from a dysphagia standpoint include a functional, functional endoscopic evaluation of swallow of fees, which is an endoscopic evaluation that allows you to visualize the larynx, the velopharynx, and the hypopharynx while swallowing. You basically look with a uh, flexible laryngoscope as the patient swallows contrast enhanced uh, or dye-enhanced um, uh, food stuff. You're able to exam examine both laryngeal and uh, pharyngeal anatomy and physiology. You can assess for secretion management, and you can also um, determine if there's uh, normal physiologic integrity to the pharyngeal swallow. Unfortunately, this limits your ability to actually see the, um, the true swallow as you get a white out when the cords close and, and when the, the, the bolus passes down to the esophagus. But by looking at um, um, presence of um, foreign material or looking at material uh, in the uh, subglottis or on the cords helps you determine whether or not there might be some aspiration risk. Um, for fees, these are some of the findings that you'll see initially. You may see premature spillage, some uh, molecular or piriform sinus residue, nasal regurgitation, penetration, or aspiration. Um, and it can also help pick up some of these anatomic things that we've discussed previously. Finally, another kind of uh, space that's really expanding within the laryngology and specifically within the office-based procedures realm is pharyngeal manometry and high-resolution uh, manometry. It basically allows for complete spatial and temporal evaluation of the pharyngeal and esophageal motor, motor function. It's very helpful in characterizing the pharyngeal propulsion as well as the, uh, the upper esophageal relaxation opening can be helpful for patients um, to diagnose the sort of site of uh, impairment when they have, when they have dysphagia. Um, it may be helpful for biofeedback as well for patients undergoing swallow therapy or patients that have muscle tension dysphagia. Um, and can be helpful for dysphagia patients that have coughing, choking, nasal regurg, or some underlying neuromuscular problems. Finally, transnasal esophagoscopy 
is another area that's sort of come along over the past probably 20 years. It allows for the evaluation and the biopsy of proximal distal, distal esophagus in, in, awake, in, in an awake patient. Um, the difference here with regard to topical anesthesia is that you have to get the patient to drink a fair amount of uh, 4% viscous lidocaine to help topicalize the uh, esophagus prior to, to working. Um, the difference between the traditional laryngoscopes and also the working channel laryngoscopes is that the transnasal esophagoscope also has the ability to insufflate, which is um, a special kind of a special uh, option for, for this scope that other working channel scopes don't have. Um, it's a very versatile scope and allows you to sort of do a really quick um, uh, uh, really quick assessment and evaluation uh, survey in the office of the esophagus of the proximal and distal esophagus to see if there's any evidence of hiatal hernia or um, Barrett's or any, anything else that might be causing a referred sensation of dysphagia up to the, the, the pharynx or the, the neck. Um, there are a number of companies that make Teenies, uh, Pentax and Olympus are the ones that are commonly used in the, Amer uh, in the United States. Um, some of the procedures, like I said before, include biopsy. Um, you can do a, a sec secondary TEP, a tracheoesophageal puncture for laryngectomy patients. You can do a balloon dilation as well, which I'll talk about next. Um, I'll talk about after this actually. So with the technique, uh, you wanna uh, use some nas nasal analgesia with a uh, lidocaine and oxybutazolin. You wanna do your viscous lidocaine, as I mentioned before. Insert the nasal scope or the TNE into the nasal cavity through the middle meatus is the best way to get down to where you need to go. And then you'll advance to the oropharynx uh, for uh, an inspection, inspection of findings and advance through the upper esophageal sphincter. And it has a two millimeter working channel that allows you to put that 1.8 millimeter biopsy forcep through it. So finally, office-based uh, dilation. So esophageal dilations have been performed for a long time. They kind of gained a little bit more um, uh, notoriety and a little bit more kind of favor in the 1900s. But even as far back as the 17th century, people were using whale bones to open up the esophagus. This sort of developed into the savory gilliard savory dilators in the bougie system. And recently, pneumatic balloon control um, uh, radial expansion devices have been used. Success rate for dilations are somewhat variable, um, but pretty favorable for most people. Um, limitations for dilation, significant fibrosis from radiation. The problem is it's, it's expensive in the OR. Historically, it's required general anesthesia. There's a risk of perforation with some of those um, wire-guided or sort of non-wire-guided uh, rigid dilators. And there's a chance of recurrence as well. The nice thing about the office-based dilation that's come along is that it's a reduction of cost in American dollars of about 15,000. Um, um, there's no major complications that have been described um, yet, but it's still new technology. It's, um, it's, uh, it's available through uh, the Cook system and it's called the Hercules 100 uh, transnasal esophageal balloon, but uh, probably any esophageal balloon could be used that has the wire guiding capability. This is just a very quick uh, video from Greg Postman from the, uh, the uh, uh, cook site of how this works. So you basically get visualization of your stenosis with the TNE, and then you put a uh, wire through the working channel. So the wire is then placed through the stenosis and it is kept in place. You need an assistant to hold it in place while you remove the scope. And then you use your balloon and you put the balloon in over top of the wire to make sure that you're going into the right area. The balloon has various uh, markings and can go up uh, in size in terms of uh, dilation size based on how many atmospheres are uh, dialed up with the, the um, syringe. So then you can see you're following the balloon in with your scope and uh, you go into the area that's stenotic, you make sure that it's sort of centered around the balloon and then you can dilate up to open up the uh, esophagus. This isn't a patient that's had a total laryngectomy. I think patient, these types of patients tolerate it a lot better than patients that have an intact larynx, um, but it is possible to do with patients that have an intact larynx as well. So you dilate up the uh, airway and the, excuse me, up the esophagus, then you'll see here in just a second that there is an improvement in the stenosis from before to after. This patient also, I think recently had a swallow study, that's why there's barium in there, the esophagus. So, um, so the, all in all, that's that's mostly it in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, office-based procedures. I think we can skip the um, uh, we can skip the the discussion of ergonomics. It's a it's a great topic, but I think it's uh, it's kind of beyond the scope of our talk here. Um, so I want to thank you again, Dr. Gandhi, and also thank you all for your rapt attention and um, look forward to answering any questions that you have. Um, thank you, thank you, Brandon, for an excellent uh, presentation, and we could understand the vast uh, new 
Arena, which has opened up in laryngeal surgery. Thank you very much. Uh, before you. taking up a uh, few questions, I would like to uh, pass on best wishes for each and every uh, delegate, participant, and ENT surgeons as a whole. Uh, have best wishes for World Voice Day today. Uh, I think we'll move forward with great encouragement, vigor, and knowledge towards the next World Voice uh, Day next year. Uh, just a one announcement from uh, our center. Uh, we are having a fellowship in laryngology for uh, uh, one year, 12 months for basically ENT surgeons, which is accredited by Royal College of Surgeons of uh, England. From this year, from today, we are announcing a fellowship for speech and language pathologists in voice and swallowing for six months. So all the details, you can just log on to our website, uh, voicelesser.com. Thank you very much. And we'll take a uh, few questions. Uh, I would request Dr. Sadha to list off some questions. Yes, sir. Uh, so, so we'll be taking up the questions. The first question is, what is the best method of hemostasis in MLS surgeries? Yeah, uh, kind of, yeah. I can take that. I, you know, I, I prefer to use a, a dilute epinephrine uh, on cottonoids or epinephrine soaked pledgets for, for hemostasis or for general mucosal oozing or, or, or bleeding. Um, I think it works very well. I'll use a dilution of one to 10,000 epinephrine um, in uh, injectable saline, and I think that it works really well. You can also do that injection into the cords prior to starting if you have a patient that you think or a lesion that you think might be especially bloody, for instance, a hemorrhagic polyp. With regard to hemostasis for uh, something that's a little bit of a larger bleed, I will use the, la the laser, but I try to use that sparingly um, so as not to cause underlying injury. Yeah, so uh, basically, um, uh, as uh, he has already told, for uh, membranous vocal cord, uh, generally keeping in adrenaline soap neuropathy over uh, the local area for two minutes would stop most of the bleeding. Uh, when you approach the cartilages, like arachnoid cartilage in uh, cordectomy or arytenectomy or the thyroid cartilage during cordectomy is for early glottic CA. When you reach perichondrium, then there are bleeders which may not be able to stop by local pressure or with the laser itself. These you can uh, cauterize with monopolar pottery with specialized uh, micro instruments we use for laser surgery. So, yeah, I think uh, these are the methods. So basically, 90% of uh, bleeders would be stopped by local application of uh, adrenaline. Maybe few of uh, them in uh, laryngeal malignancies or uh, cordectomies, you may need to use monoclonal Okay, sir. Uh, so the next question is for Dr. Brandon from Osoal, sir. Uh, apart from medical contraindications to GA, is outpatient sur laser surgery undertaken solely due to cost considerations? And uh, how many patients have opted out to GA following the first outpatient experience? Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. I'd say cost is a big driver for it here in the United States. I think our system is such that there's a lot of medical expenditure. And so I think that there's a huge drive to get most people into, uh, if there is an outpatient setting or an ability to do something in an outpatient setting, I think that there's a drive to push patients towards that, that, that arena. Um, in addition to that, I think that there are a number of other advantages, just the fact that the patients can undergo recurrent procedures, um, that it doesn't necessarily, um, uh, like you, like you said, burn any bridges or cause any uh, exposure to general anesthesia that's unwarranted or unnecessary. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, in, in my experience, I think most of the patients um, appreciate having the option for laser surgery in the office. The way that I approach um, specifically papilloma, I won't go directly to office-based surgery. I actually will do an, uh, a, a formal uh, uh, suspension microlaryngoscopy in the OR uh, for papilloma, for dysplasia, for cancer initially, um, for benign phonotrauma of traumatic lesions. I, I will go to the OR because there's more control there. There is uh, improved ability to get hemostasis and all of those things. 
um, are important for the first time that you're treating the patient and also being able to get a, an adequate biopsy without, underlying, without damaging or disrupting the underlying superficial limb and appropria. However, for patients that I've seen and that have just sort of an area of pocket of recurrence here or there um, of papilloma or whatnot or even dysplasia, um, once I've treated them once, then I'll start to transition them towards the office and I'll kind of lay the groundwork for that when I first meet them. So they're aware that that might be some of the, um, some of the pattern of treatment subsequently. Okay, sir. Uh, next question is for Dr. Gandhi. Latest treatment options to prevent recurrence of respiratory papillomatosis. I think uh, what's practically uh, used in many centers and we use and which has shown good results is again Avastin, uh, local injection of Avastin, Bevel, uh, C, Zumar. Jointly with KTP, or maybe uh, if the lesions are small enough, you know, can inject uh, Avastin itself as a treatment. But they would increase the uh, interval between the two, su two surgeries. Silofovir also can be tried and can be used to again prolong the uh, recurrence. Uh, if they are too extensive, maybe I have already told monoclonal antibodies and uh, photoronal therapy have been tried and is under evaluation. But I think uh, practically availability wise and result wise, Avastin and Sudofovir uh, may be suggested. The next question is for Dr. Brandon. Uh, so what is your experience in terms of fat injection medialization in cases of vocal cord palsy patients and sulcus patients? I don't use it often for sulcus patients. I find that with sulcus patients, I, 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 it's difficult to just do medialization because what you're doing, uh, in, at least in my experience, what, what happens is this area of thinned or narrowed superficial lamina propria, this in, immobile or inflexible segment, um, you're expanding it and you're putting it under greater tension, which decreases its pliability even further and can sometimes conversely or paradoxically worsen the voice. Um, I will use fat injection for patients that have a, me, uh, a vocal cord paralysis and have um, the desire not to undergo a transcervical medialization um, a procedure, but want a long-term result or long-term benefit to the injection. I think it works well. The problem with fat is I think it tends to extravasate into places outside of the periglottic space over time. Um, I've had a number of patients that I've done injections of fat on who I'd had to go back and do more injections of fat and or just say, okay, let's do a medialization learning to plasty with cortex or with silastic um, because the fat sort of tends to, to, to over time tends to go into other places or more importantly, the fat gets resorbed by about 40 to 60% over time, usually by about three to six months. So you have to actually over inject fat, which for some with a limited uh, abduction of the contralateral side can be a, a, a concerning problem for airway obstruction. Okay, so. And one, sorry, one more quick point about the, so I don't know, Dr. Gandhi, if you've experienced this, but sometimes sodafavir for uh, papilloma, to that other question, can cause an inflammatory response that causes a little bit of fibrosis, fibrosis of the vocal cords themselves. So I've tried to stay away from sodafavir more recently as, as it can cause some, some increased hoarseness. I don't know if you... Some sound issues. Uh, can you hear me? Whatever I heard, uh, yes, uh, we have to be very careful when using uh, laser over the membranous vocal cord or deeper into the lamina propria in papilloma cases because of the uh, scarring and repeated surgeries. I was not able to really get through the question. Uh, Brandon, uh, I think. You have to, uh, yeah. Question is that injection pseudofovir it induces fibrosis and more hoarseness in patients. Yes, yes. Yeah, it, it has been noted. Uh, see, uh, I have not used pseudofovir in uh, any pediatric RRPs. All uh, my cases have been adult, aggressive, uh, and causing airway obstruction. So these paper patients really have gone multiple surgeries till now. And Really, uh, it's very difficult to ascertain 
the uh, fibrosis which has been as a result of pseudophagy but yes when we use them in pediatric cases it's very significant okay uh, so the last question of the day is treatment of acute hoarseness yeah man you are the right person because singers okay. are usually uh, they call you on telephone yeah i am about to go for uh, my performance and my voice is hoarse yeah it's it's a very um it's an interesting you know question obviously i like for patients to come in or to be seen by me who exactly what's going on because acute hoarseness can be so many different things could it be hemorrhage could it be you know could it be uh, acute laryngitis could it be uh, muscle tension issues you don't know until you take a look so i always encourage my patients to to come in sometimes that's not possible and i think you have to make a decision especially if it's someone who's a high kind of high functioning performing person you have to make a decision about whether or not their safety and their vocal health um, would be compromised if they were to get on that stage and try to sing through their hoarseness a lot of times steroids are recommended or are, are suggested, but I don't like to give steroids without taking a look again, because it actually can increase conversely your rate of having a hemorrhage uh, for certain pathology. So, you know, it's helpful for me to, to take a look and see, it's kind of a broad question, but it's a good question. You know, there are a lot of considerations that go into making a decision about how to diagnose and treat, but also how to um, discuss with a patient who might be wanting to get on stage and perform or wanting to do something um, that allows them to uh, that allows them to kind of further their career at the time. I don't know what, what are your thoughts, Dr. Uh, I think uh, there are uh, multiple uh, I mean, uh, inquiries like this. Uh, what my answer would be if it is urgent and they can't visit the clinic, then uh, take anti reflux and uh, nebulization. I always ask them to take steroid nebulization uh, just before the performance or uh, maybe two or three days ahead, and a lot of hydration. Because they have an air travel, and because of the air travel, there is a lot of dryness. And I think uh, hydration, um, video court or steroid nebulization ahead of their performance, maybe uh, you can ask them to have mucolytic uh, uh, agents uh, for nebulization. And of course, anti-reflux medicines. Yeah. Yeah, nebulization is great. I, I agree with that. And then mucolytics as well definitely can help a lot. Okay, so, so we conclude our session here, sir. Thank you. Um, and any of the questions, please uh, let us know on email and we'll definitely uh, in touch with you with the answers from the relevant speakers. Thank you, Braden, for spending your time early morning for you. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Brandon, sir. Thank you, Gandhi, sir. Next break.